It is good to be with you tonight. I hope you're all doing well this week. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, I hope you will give me a call or send an email and let me know. Please get in touch. And also please remember that we are continuing to meet every Lord's Day morning at 9 o'clock for worship. And we have the plan on the website there. If you plan on attending the 9 a.m. service, I hope you will use the Sign Up Genius to sign up so we know who's coming. We've had a number of visitors be with us over the last several weeks, and it always helps when... I get emails through the church website or through Facebook to be able to uh, tell people, yes, there is room. And so it helps if all of us sign up. We really appreciate that. If you have any questions about the schedule, let me know. If you have any trouble with the Sign Up Genius account, get in touch with either me or with Kenna. And if you're listening by the phone and need any help with this, or if there's anything that we can do to serve you as a congregation, anything that we need to be praying about, I hope you will give me a call at 608-224-0274. Uh, I have some good news tonight. I am not in front of the woodpile tonight. I have finally removed the desk from my office. And before my uh, fellow elders gets concerned that I've removed the desk and have replaced it with a lazy boy, <laughs> that, that's not what's going on here. And uh, since the pandemic began, I've found myself doing most of my reading in uh, either outside, in the backyard. I mean, what I do is read and study a lot of the time, a good percentage of the time. And so outside in the summer, uh, sometimes I'll run over to the church building for something and spend some hours reading over there kind of to get away from the regular routine. Or maybe in the main part of the house is the way it's been for the past five months or so in the winter in front of the wood stove upstairs where it's warmer. And in the middle of this, I suddenly realized I don't really need a desk for that. I don't need a desk for reading. And in fact, what I really need is just a good chair and good lighting. So a comfortable place to be that is well lit. And so instead of being hunched over a desk, I just need somewhere good to sit and somewhere where I can uh, see what I'm reading. And so uh, last week, about a week ago, I dragged the desk out of my office and took it out in chunks and put it out by the road. This week was large item collection week. They canceled that yesterday because of the snow we had. But uh, this morning, the guy came and picked it up with the claw truck, which was really cool had a mattress out there as well so got that out of the way the desk is gone and now I'm looking for something of a surface to use for something of a standing desk I'm here in my office and I want to put uh, like a two by six foot or two by five foot beam or plank or something big and solid on top of my uh, bookshelves down here so I can stand up and read and do the other office type work that is sometimes required and I've been scouring Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist and the thrift stores for a number of days now. And finally, I was on my way to church yesterday to the church building to do the snow blowing. Uh, if anybody wants to help out with that, let me know. <laughs> but I was on my way over there yesterday on a Tuesday to snow blow and happened to stop by the Goodwill at Southtown off of Broadway there, uh, just by the Walmart. They had the world's heaviest desk. And it was a good size, had a two-inch thick slab on top of it. It was $9.99, and I was on my way to Habitat Restore to look there for big pieces of wood, and I thought for $9.99, I'll just buy the whole desk and take the top off and use that, and then recycle the rest of the wood in some other way. So it took four people to get that desk in our Subaru, and I took it home. I literally had to take it apart in the Subaru in order for me to get it out. It was so heavy, I could not get it out of the car without taking it apart in chunks. And so I've disassembled it, and I'm working on that slab now and hope to get that installed down here. And so I'll tell you, it's a work in progress. Uh, I took the desk out, as I said last week, a desk that I have been using for more than 20 years now. And so there is some stuff around the office here. I've just hung a sheet up here temporarily. I don't know if I'll replace that with something else, maybe something uh, darker. Uh, I'm still working on the lighting, so again, not perfect, but I think we did as best as we could to get rid of the uh, at least the worst reflections on the glasses. That's been the biggest challenge with the lighting. Uh, but the desk was made by an in uh, for an insurance company in Chicago back in 1981. There was a sticker on the bottom of it, so I hope to restore the top of it and cut that down, and hopefully it'll fit in this place, and hopefully we can tweak this and get this a little bit better and improve this in the near future. Uh, tonight, we get back to our study of the book of Luke. And by way of review, in case you might be joining us for the first time, we know Luke is a Gentile. He's a medical doctor. He includes a lot of people and groups that were uh, often overlooked or abused in the ancient 
ancient world, women, Gentiles, Samaritans, the sick, the poor, and so on. So that's the emphasis in the book of Luke. He includes a lot of that that's not included in the other gospel accounts. And once again, I'll just say it, the, the harmony of the Gospels is extremely helpful, especially tonight, especially in the last week of the Lord's life. It is a valuable tool, and especially leading up to the crucifixion and the crucifixion itself. It, it's very helpful to have the four accounts side by side in parallel columns. Okay, last week we had already made our way through the three phases of the Jewish trial and so last week we looked at the three phases of the Roman trial so Jesus is brought by the Jews after they've convicted him and he's brought by the Jews before Pilate and there's a little bit of back and forth there Pilate then learns that Jesus is a Galilean and lo and behold I might be able to toss this case and so he sends it to uh, Herod across town Herod the Tetrarch and Jesus says nothing before Herod, has no respect for uh, the man himself. And so Herod then tosses it back to Pilate. It goes on from there. I believe Jesus is declared innocent four or five times in that process by a number of different people, including Herod, Pilate, and uh, Pilate's wife. And so he goes through that trial, and yet despite Pilate's best efforts to uh, have Jesus be chosen by the Jews as the one who gets released during the festival, they choose Barabbas instead, a murderer, a robber, and an insurrectionist. And so at the end of class last week, we left off with Pilate delivering Jesus over to be crucified. That's where we left it. And so Pilate gives the order, basically, crucify him, and the Roman soldiers then take it from there. In the harmony, Matthew and Mark both tell us about Jesus being mocked by the soldiers again. And this takes place a number of times through that uh, evening and the early morning hours through various places. Uh, they take him at this point back into the Praetorium. That was the official residence of the governor, the governor's mansion, as we would say here in Wisconsin. They strip Jesus of his clothing. They put a scarlet robe on him. They weave a crown of thorns. They put that on his head. And then the soldiers bow down before him, praising him or pretending to praise him, mocking him as being the king of the Jews. And they then spit on him. And I don't know if anybody's ever spit on you as a way of ridicule or in a fight or something, but how humiliating that is and how frustrating it is and how much you'd want to take revenge if at all possible. But Jesus holds himself back and they then beat him on the head with a reed a number of times. In my mind, as I've tried to picture this, as I've read through it a number of times through the years, I've always imagined that this happens with Jesus and just a small group of Roman soldiers, maybe six, seven, eight men. But Matthew and Mark both tell us that the soldiers called together the whole Roman cohort. And if I remember correctly, a cohort was a group of up to 600 men. And so this is a large group group and that's not normally the way I imagine this but as Jesus is mocked and spit upon and has the crown of thorns placed upon his head as they beat him with the reeds it's not just a small group of Roman soldiers in a back room but it is a large uh, group of men abusing him in this way so we now pick up with Luke tonight and tonight I hope we can cover the first three hours of the crucifixion so this would be from 9 a.m. until noon He's nailed to the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning. At noon, there is a break in the coverage. There is a change that takes place. So we'll get to that next week. I don't want us to go past uh, that point tonight. And so we really only have two paragraphs in Luke to study tonight. The first section has Jesus moving from the praetorium, the governor's official residence, to the cross. And so we have Jesus making that little journey. It wasn't far, but just kind of out of town, right outside the gate to the cross. And then the next paragraph, the second paragraph for us to look at tonight, basically covers everything that happens between 9 a.m. and noon. And we'll bring in a number of the other accounts as we study this. All right, so tonight we start in Luke with Luke 23, verses 26 through 32. Luke 23, verses 26 through 32. When they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country, and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And following him was a large crowd of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. 
But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were being led away to be put to death with him. We know that Jesus is nailed to the cross at 9 a.m. We'll get to the actual uh, time that's mentioned a little bit later tonight. But this happens right before that. So this is leading up to his actual crucifixion at 9 a.m. So I don't know if this is 8.30 in the morning, 8.45. It's just, it's imminent. It's just a few minutes away, right before 9 a.m. Matthew tells us that they take the robe off. And then they put his own garments back on him. Remember, Jesus had been beaten and scourged repeatedly a number of times up to this moment. What happens if you're covered in wounds and then keep taking off and putting on clothing? Well, it would hurt, wouldn't it? And so the blood would clot. It would stick to the fabric. And then that gets pulled away. And then something else gets put back on. And then that gets taken off. And something else gets put back on. Well, that's what's going on. And that's what has happened over the past several hours. It happens again here. And so they lead him away, having changed his clothing yet again. John tells us that he is bearing his own cross. And so he leaves the praetorium carrying his own cross. But here in Luke, we find that as they lead him away, so somewhere in that process, somewhere along that little journey, Luke says they lay hold of one Simon of Cyrene coming in from the country and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. Now, I've always assumed that Jesus stumbled and fell under the weight of it. And I think we have a, a few songs that we sing that may say something to that effect. And yet, as I've looked at these accounts, as I've done the best I can to look elsewhere in Scripture, I, I can't see that anywhere. I, I can't see that that's the reason that's given. I can't find an explanation in scripture as to why Simon is called in to carry it. It's probably safe to assume that Jesus was unable to carry it due to extreme uh, fatigue from the lack of sleep and also from the various beatings through the night. And that's probably why Simon is brought in here. But I would just point out here as we begin this paragraph that we really aren't told specifically that that is the reason why. It's probably, again, safe to assume that. Uh, but we just aren't told directly. Matthew and Mark both tell us that Simon is pressed into service. That's how they word it. He is pressed into service. Luke tells us that uh, Simon just so happens to be coming in from the country. And so we combine these things together. We learn, therefore, that Simon is a visitor. And here is this man just minding his own business. And he passes this procession. He's on his way into town. The soldiers, along with Jesus and the criminals, are on their way out. And so they pass along the way, and he is forced by these soldiers to carry a cross. And so he's forced to do a U-turn, and he has to go back out of town from where he had just come. Remember, back in Matthew chapter 5, verse 41, Jesus, a number of years before this, had said, "...whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too." And that goes back to the fact that Roman law allowed soldiers to grab people at random and force them to carry their pack or whatever they had that they were carrying for one mile. That was the law. And after that one mile, they could find somebody else and force them to carry it a mile and so on. And so the soldiers didn't have to carry all of that heavy stuff. If they could find a subject to force to carry it a mile, that was allowed under Roman law. Well, of course, Jesus taught when that mile is over, you, as my people, I want you to offer to carry it a second mile. And so do more than you are called upon to do. Even when you are oppressed, do more than is expected of you. Go above and beyond, even when we don't feel like it. Of course, that goes back to the Sermon on the Mount. And so here, Simon is pressed into service. That's that concept of the Romans being allowed to do this according to their own law. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that uh, this man is from Cyrene. 
And we look that up, we find that Cyrene is a city in northern Africa. I believe it's just west of Egypt in, in what is now Libya. And for some reason, Mark points out that Simon is the father of Alexander and Rufus. And that's a little strange, isn't it? Here's this guy. He's forced to carry the Lord's cross. He is the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why in the world would he say that? Why was this so important to Mark that he mentions these two sons of this man? Well, we don't know for sure. It's possible, though, that whoever Mark is writing to might have known at least one of these men. And so as he's writing, he basically says, this is Simon, you know, Alexander and Rufus's dad. And so the assumption is perhaps that those who read the book of Mark for the first time would have known at least one of these two men. And that would have been perhaps a personal reference that would have had significance to those who read the book of Mark for the first time. And, um, and so there's this guy, and there's a chance that uh, he's named for this reason. If you remember, Mark was written to a Roman audience, and Rufus is apparently a Roman. Uh, in the reference over in the book of Romans, uh, this man, Rufus, is referred to, may or may not be the same guy, but Paul says, greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. And so this is also interesting. Uh, if this is the same guy, if this is the same Rufus, Rufus's mother would have therefore probably been Mrs. Simon, right? Married to Simon of Cyrene. So just a bit of speculation here, not teaching this as fact, but just thinking out loud about one possibility. Carrying Jesus' cross would have had a way of perhaps changing Simon's life. Can we imagine that? We're coming into the city. We've come in from northern Africa, all the way from Libya to celebrate the Passover. On our way into town, we are forced by some Roman soldiers to carry some guy's cross. If you were Simon, do you think you would have stuck around maybe a little bit just to kind of see what happens next? You're forced to carry this cross for this man, this unknown man, and you drop it off there at the place of execution. Do you think you may just kind of be curious about what happens next? I, I know I would be. And just, if I could speak for Simon here, I'd be interested. I'd be curious, why is all of this happening? What has this man done uh, that ends up with me uh, forced to carry his cross? And so then I'm wondering, would he have perhaps stuck around for a few weeks on a trip this large, all the way from Northern Africa? And I ask because um, in, in the Bible, we understand there would have been prophecies fulfilled all day on this Friday. I mean, left and right, one after the other, prophecies are fulfilled. And do you think that he might have stuck around a few weeks to see what happens next? And I ask that because of what Luke will go on to write in Acts chapter 1, verse 10. We read there about those who came together for Pentecost included people from Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. All right, so we put all that together and it's a little bit weird to me that Cyrene is specifically mentioned as being represented on the day of Pentecost when a guy from Cyrene just so happens to have been chosen by the Romans to carry the Lord's cross and then He's the father of Alexander and Rufus. And then we have Rufus mentioned in the book of Romans. Just all of these things added together are, are rather interesting. So there's a lot that we could perhaps learn from this. And another note on the whole carrying of the cross thing, we're starting to see here that the Romans have perfected this process. Their goal is to make this as cruel and as public as possible, as punishment, but also as a deterrent to anybody else who might be thinking about doing something against the empire. This was public. It was humiliating by design. But I would also point out it is also efficient. They were good at what they did, if we want to put it in those terms. Uh, Jesus being too tired or too weak was not going to slow this down. Crucifixion stops for no one. And certainly the Romans wouldn't be bothered with carrying a cross themselves for somebody. They have an empire full of subjects uh, to do that for them. By the way, before we move on from this, 
Didn't Jesus say something about carrying our own cross? Over in Luke 14, 27, for example, he says that whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Simon is now literally carrying the Lord's cross on his behalf. After the incident with Simon, Luke continues in a way that the other accounts do not. He gives us some more information about the procession itself. Notice he tells us in verse 27 that Jesus is followed by a great multitude. And in keeping with his own emphasis, Luke makes sure to let us know that there were a large number of women in this group. So again, this is something Luke cannot skip. The others do, but Luke makes sure we know that when the apostles themselves were too scared to follow along, they all scattered at the beginning. There are women who have the courage to stick with the Lord through this, at least from a distance. They are there following, and they are mourning and lamenting over him. Again, remember, the apostles fled, but the women are still keeping up with this in a way that the apostles apparently are not, at least at this point. So Jesus then turns to these women. So even in his exhausted state. He's already been uh, punished and tormented and, and all of that. But even in that condition, Jesus turns to these women and he basically tells them to mourn, not for him, but for themselves and for their children. There's a time coming when it'll be easier for those who've never had children. And I know we talked about this a few weeks ago in the discussion of the destruction of Jerusalem, and that seems to be the reference here. Within a generation or so, about 40 years down the line, Jerusalem itself would be punished for rejecting Jesus for what they are doing right here at this moment. And I think that seems to be the reference to uh, verse 31, for if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? The way I understand that, the best that I could figure is Jesus is saying, if they will persecute me like this, and I'm nothing like a real political revolutionary. I'm not trying to throw over the Roman government, overthrow the Roman government. What will the Romans do to those people who really are? And that's what will end up happening in the late 60s leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70. And then finally in verse 32 we have this passing reference that there are two others, actual criminals, actual evildoers who are being led away to be crucified with Jesus. And it's often assumed that these are some of Barabbas's accomplices in the insurrection. That is perhaps why they were scheduled to be executed together, that the three of them uh, participated in some way and, and did that murder and insurrection and the robbery uh, together as a group. All right, let's move on then to Luke 23 verses 33 through 43. Luke 23 verses 33 through 43. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. But there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Back in verse 32 that we looked at earlier, Jesus and the soldiers and the crowds and the other two criminals, along with Simon carrying the cross, they all show up at the place called the skull here in verse 33. And we have a few theories on this, starting with the idea that there were a bunch of skulls at this place. All right, that's one possibility. This is a place of execution. And so maybe there are skeletons there along, especially with the skulls, kind of as a 
a marker. Don't do stuff like these people did or this will happen to you. So something of a warning. Uh, you know, behave. Be a good citizen of Rome, otherwise uh, you might be next. The other possibility is that the place itself looked like a skull. If you can see on the left side of the picture here, you'll notice the Dome of the Rock. That is the Islamic holy site that I referred to a month or two ago when we studied Matthew 24. Uh, in the foreground, or I guess right under the dome there, is something of a retaining wall or the city wall. Uh, and then there's the valley. Uh, but the, the Dome of the Rock is located where the temple used to be. And then if you look over on the right-hand side of the picture, you'll notice that rounded hill. And it almost looks like the top of a skull. It's a very smooth, rounded hill right there. The cranium, I guess we might say. And so that's one possibility, that Jesus was crucified on the top of that hill. And it was given that name uh, because it looked like the top of somebody's skull. Uh, this is the other possibility. This is located right outside the old city of Jerusalem. There is a rock outcropping that also almost looks like a skull. And I know land features change over time. 2,000 years have gone by. We've got erosion. We've got construction. A lot of things have happened. Uh, they put a picture on the, like the light pole there on the right-hand side. And this was taken back, I think, in the early 1800s, maybe mid to late 1800s. But that picture emphasizes the, the eye sockets. If you can see that in the picture there on that light pole in the foreground, the uh, kind of the, the eye sockets and the skull on the cliff face. And so the idea is that Jesus might have been crucified on top of this outcropping. If you notice up on top there, there's a little fenced-in area. looks like some uh, little monuments, probably some stuff, you know, for tourists to look at. There's an antenna. And then down on the, the ground level under this cliff, you'll notice tour buses <laughs> just packed in there. So this is obviously a very well-known, famous site and a, kind of a holy site, we might say. I wouldn't call it a holy site. We don't have holy sites like that in the Lord's, uh, in our understanding of the Bible. Nothing holy about any land anywhere. We are holy as his people. Oh, but nevertheless, it is a very important site in, in the Christian faith in general. I think we might say that. But to the Romans, uh, this was the perfect location. It was located along a main road into town. It would have been very public, would have served as a deterrent to any insurrection. Basically, this is a billboard advertising Rome's power over the city of Jerusalem as a place of execution. We can do whatever we want to you people here, is what this would have communicated. While we're on the name of the place, I would also mention that years ago, I remember a preacher friend of mine mentioning that the word Calvary is never found in the Bible. And he just kind of, we were having a discussion about something else and he mentioned this and, and Calvary is never found in the Bible. And, and he was suggesting that we probably shouldn't really be singing songs with words like the word Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary and so on. That, that this is a word that's, that is not biblical. It's not there. And I, and I thought, surely he must be wrong. Everybody knows that Calvary is in the Bible. I mean, we sing about it. it. It's in there. However, I actually opened my Bible. <laughs> And I, and I started looking for it. And amazingly, Calvary is not found in the Bible. And so this guy I was talking to was right. But many Bibles do include a footnote on the place that is called the skull. And they indicate that skull is translated into Latin as Calvarius. Calvarius or Calvary. And so I guess if we spoke Latin... A Calvary is, in fact, a biblical word. So I would suggest then that Calvary is a biblical word. We just need to know what it means. I think it'd be similar to the word fetus. If fetus is just the Latin word for baby. Of course, today, people talk about a fetus as if it's not a baby sometimes. And, of course, you've got a whole argument there based on the definition of a word. Uh, but I would say it's kind of similar here. Calvary is simply the Latinized version of of the word skull. Uh, by the way, the Hebrew version of skull is Golgotha. The Greek version of this is cranion or cranium. And so skull, calvary, Golgotha, cranium all mean the same thing in English, Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. So skull, calvary, Golgotha, cranium, the place of the skull going back to various languages and so I guess my point is here 
Jesus was crucified at a place called the skull. We don't know exactly where it was. Might have been a place, might have been this place, might have been the other place with the rounded top, or might have just been a place where a lot of skulls were found, but that was its name by reputation. All right, as we come back to verse 33, we find that Jesus is crucified between the two criminals, Jesus in the middle, one of them on the right, the other one on the left. Matthew and Mark both tell us that the soldiers give Jesus wine mixed with gall or myrrh, depending on the account, but he refuses to drink it. He turns it away. Uh, some have suggested that this was something of a painkiller. And Jesus, though, he wanted to go through this process clear-headed, fully conscious, aware in every possible way. He did not want anything to cloud his judgment. And I find that interesting. He turned this down. He'll accept the sour wine later as a liquid so he could continue speaking, but at least this part of it uh, that is considered to be the painkiller, he did not want it and he turned it away. In verse 34, all through this process, they, uh, as they nailed him to the cross, Jesus is continually saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And I believe this is only found here in Luke. It's not in Matthew, Mark, or John. And the tense of the verb indicates that this wasn't just said once. Jesus didn't just say, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. But Jesus was saying this over and over and over again. As he was nailed to the cross, as he was lifted up, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. As I understand it, Jesus knows that these soldiers really don't understand the depth of what's going on here. They're just doing their job. Judas knew better. The Jewish authorities knew better. The Roman soldiers, however, are simply following orders. They do not know what they are doing. This doesn't mean that they're innocent. Uh, this doesn't excuse them at all. After all, Jesus wants them to be forgiven. And so they are sinning by doing this. This is an act that is needing forgiveness. But the Lord's hope and prayer is that these men will at least at some point be forgiven. These men won't be saved against their will. In other words, um, they will need to repent and obey the gospel just like everybody else does. But it's encouraging to me that forgiveness is at least a possibility for these men who are actually nailing Jesus to the cross. And I think the lesson, practically speaking, for us is if these men can be saved who actually drove the nails into his hands and feet, then I can be saved. Then any of us can be saved. And that's encouraging. If they can be saved, there's hope for all of us. I would also take this as a reminder that ignorance is no excuse, is it? Even though we don't know what we're doing, we still need to be forgiven. In the second half of verse 34, notice Luke says that the soldiers cast lots and they divide up the Lord's garments. That tells us, first of all, that he's probably not wearing any clothing at this point. They, they take everything off. There's nothing left. According to John's account, the soldiers divide up the Lord's outer garments. So you take this piece, I'll take this piece, and so on. But when they discover that the inner garment, the tunic, was seamless, woven in one piece, they decide not to tear it but instead to cast lots to see who gets it. Obviously, tearing it would have made it less valuable, and so they basically roll the dice for it, is the way that we would say it today, or draw straws, something like that. Uh, John tells us that this fulfilled a prophecy from Psalm 22:18, where David says, they divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And so this was prophesied many, many years ago, hundreds of years earlier. And the soldiers, of course, had no idea that they're fulfilling prophecy. They don't go into this day thinking, now um, Psalm 22 says we need to gamble for this guy's clothes, so let's make sure we don't forget that in the process of nailing him to the cross. Nothing like that at all. But 900 years earlier, King David, as he wrote Psalm 22, could in some way see this coming by way of inspiration, and it is fulfilled with these men having no clue what they've just done. At this point, the harmony skips over verses 35, 36, and 37, so there's a little bit of a flip-flop to harmonize the four accounts. So just for us, skipping down to verse 38 for now, we find in all four accounts, Pilate orders an inscription to be put on the cross. Uh, he has a sign posted indicating the charges against Jesus. Luke records it as simply saying, the king of the Jews. 
Matthew's account says this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Mark's account says the King of the Jews. John's account says Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. And so the wording is slightly different between the four accounts, but we need to realize from John's account that the statement was also written in three languages. And that's easy for us to miss here if we don't bring John in on this. So it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. And so this might explain the slight variations. That's one possibility. Uh, Hebrew was the language of the Jews. That's who Pilate's dealing with here. Latin was the official language of the Roman Empire. So this is an official document, so to speak. And then Greek was basically a universal language at that time, the language of commerce, almost like English is today. And so this was for the travelers coming in for the feast from all over the world. The other possibility is that each account only includes part of the full inscription. So there is no contradiction here. We don't have different things. It doesn't say something wasn't written on the cross. But when we combine all four, the sign says, this is Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. And then that, of course, was in the three different languages. Um, have you seen a, a Catholic crucifix with the letters I-N-R-I up there on the sign above the cross? I know I've seen that. I'm sure you have as well. Inri, I-N-R-I up there above the cross. Well, those letters represent the words Jesus, Nazarene, King, and Jews. So it, I don't know, an abbreviation, not, that's not really what you call it, acronym, I guess. But uh, those letters represent Jesus, Nazarene, King of the Jews. So that's the I-N-R-I that we sometimes see. Uh, in John, the chief priest object to Pilate. And they say, do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. And Pilate answers, what I have written, I have written. Wow. It seems to me that Pilate pretty much hated these people. And he knew that this would make them mad, but he does it anyway. The king of the Jews. And so he's insulting the Jewish leaders in the process. And I'm pretty sure Pilate's probably pretty upset about being forced into this crucifixion. I mean, due to political pressure, he's crucifying an, an innocent man. He's declared him innocent a number of times personally. And if he's doing it, he's doing it this way not their way. And so he takes this as another opportunity to insult the Jewish leadership. Uh, as the sign is posted, Mark says, and it was the third hour when they crucified him. The third hour is basically the third hour uh, since sunrise. So about nine o'clock in the morning as we would keep track of time today. So Jesus then is nailed to the cross about nine o'clock on Friday morning. At this point, we skip back to verse 35. And Luke tells us that the people stood by looking on. Matthew and Mark both tell us that those who were passing by were wagging their heads and hurling abuse at him. So uh, they're quoting Jesus as talking about uh, tearing down the temple and rebuilding it in three days. In other words, he's a big talker. Let's see what he does now. He's not looking so tough now, is he, kind of thing. And so they're saying, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. That's one thing that was repeated. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have the ruler saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. In Matthew, they even seem to insult God the Father in this process. He trusts in God, let him deliver him now. So they're calling on God to deliver Jesus. Uh, if he takes pleasure in him, for he said, I am the Son of God. So they're insulting not only the Son, but they're also insulting the Father here. Uh, we can't even imagine the, the control, the self-control that God must have had not to retaliate and to just to end this immediately. He could have ended the entire human race at this point. Uh, Matthew tells us that the two criminals were saying the same things to Jesus. Both of them uh, on the right and the left were joining in in the insulting, at least at the beginning. In Luke, though, it seems that one of the two criminals, somewhere along the line, has a change of heart. One of the men is saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answers and says to the first, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And so this isn't the greatest endorsement, but I think we now have a criminal declaring Jesus to be innocent. And this criminal was saying repeatedly, Again, the tense of the verb, not just once, but over and over again, 
Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And this is where Jesus says, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Uh, here many people see what Jesus says and, and they argue, if the thief on the cross can be saved without baptism, then certainly we don't need to be baptized today. Have you heard that argument? I know I've heard that a number of times as people try to evade what the Bible teaches about the necessity of baptism. They, they bring this up and they, they throw this at us. Look, that guy wasn't baptized, therefore I don't have to be. I've preached on this a time or two through the years and there are a few ways to approach this. Uh, first of all, the whole argument hinges on the possibility that the thief was not baptized, right? They go into that saying, he was not baptized, therefore I don't have to be. Well, obviously he was not baptized while he was on the cross, so that doesn't happen. However, are we really safe in basing an entire argument on the assumption that this man was never baptized? And that, that's a, the first danger, I guess, with that argument I would just point out. After all, in Mark 1, 5, with reference to John's baptism, Mark says, And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. So when somebody says, he wasn't baptized, therefore I don't have to be, I would say, do you really know that this man was not baptized? Obviously not on the cross. But reading from Mark 1, 5, it sounds like baptism was the thing to do back then when almost everybody went out to John to be baptized. So let's we could look at it that way. That would be one caution to throw out there. We could also make the argument that while he was alive, Jesus could forgive sins any way he wanted to. And he often did, didn't he? Um, it would be like me giving somebody $100. And my kids getting upset because they're set to get my inheritance. Is, le is that legitimate? Well, they can get mad at whatever they want to, right? We understand that, but we all understand that while a person is alive, they can do whatever they want to with their money before the will goes into effect. And maybe in a slightly similar way, the New Testament is like a will, the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. And before Jesus dies, he can forgive sins however he wants to, as he did with the paralyzed man. Uh, let down through the roof by his friends, if you remember that. Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. No repentance there. No confession there. No baptism in that passage. The young man didn't even have faith at that point. Matthew says that when Jesus saw the faith of his friends, Jesus forgave the man's sins. So how far will we take that argument? You know, not even faith is required to be forgiven of sins. I mean, if we're going to judge forgiveness today based on when Jesus can or can't forgive when he's alive, that's kind of where we're heading with that. And this leads us to what I think is perhaps the best way to handle this. We need to understand what covenant this man was under at the moment. And if we're studying with people, we might want to ask them, at what point does the new covenant go into effect? And it'd be similar to the question, when does my will go into effect? I've got a will. When does it go into effect? Well, obviously when I die. In the same way, the law of Christ went into effect at the moment of his death. And so I would ask, where is he on this chart? You know, is, are we talking about Jesus before his death or after his death? And of course, this is uh, before the death of the Lord. And so if he wasn't yet under uh, the law of Christ, the law that demands baptism, then what law was this man under? Well, we don't know. we got a couple possibilities. If he's a Gentile, then he was under the law of the heart, according to Romans chapter 2. Gentiles didn't have really a written law from God like the Jews did, but they were just under the law of the conscience, we might say. They had to do the best they could not to murder their neighbors. And the Lord would judge them appropriately on the last day. They had to follow the conscience. Um, or if this man was a Jew, then he was under the law of Moses, wasn't he? He was under the, the Ten Commandments and so on. And, and baptism was not a requirement under the law of Moses. It'd be like saying David wasn't baptized or, or Noah wasn't baptized even before. Uh, that'd be a good illustration for the law of the heart with Gentiles, with Noah there. So a number of ways that we can go about this, but I, I would ask which covenant was this man under? Was it the law of the heart? Was it the law of Moses? Or was it the law of Christ? Obviously not the law of Christ because this takes place before the Lord's death 
on the cross. So I hope that this helps a little bit, just a very simple chart there. If you have any questions, uh, please get in touch. I'd love to discuss it further. Feel free to look on our website and find that lesson from who knows, like 10 years ago or something. It's probably out there. Um, but it's a dangerous thing to try to dismiss the need for baptism by suggesting that the thief was never baptized. First of all, he might have been. There's a good chance that he was. Secondly, Jesus could forgive sins however he wanted to before he died, before his covenant went into effect. And then finally, the thief was not yet living under the uh, law of Christ, a time when baptism was necessary for everybody. In the harmony, John now has this Jesus arranging for the care of his mother. This is not in Luke, but I want to mention it here. Uh, remember, Jesus is the firstborn in the family. We know that he has uh, four brothers and at least two sisters, but Jesus is the oldest. Um, we don't have a reference to Joseph at any time after uh, Jesus was left in the temple at 12 years old. So Joseph disappears for some reason. We assume that he died. That's the most likely scenario. And so Mary is perhaps a widow. And so on the cross, Jesus looks at his mom and says, Woman, behold your son. And he says to John, Behold your mother. And John then says, And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. And so it seems then that John basically adopts Mary into his family at this point. Uh, by the way, this comes right after the soldiers cast lots for that one-piece woven tunic. I've read that mothers often made those for their kids when they launched out on their own. And so it's possible then that when the soldiers cast lots for the tunic, perhaps handmade by Mary for Jesus, Jesus then thinks of his mother. And obviously she would have thought about that at the same time as well. And at that moment is when Jesus makes sure that she is taken care of. Everything we've studied tonight takes place between 9 a.m. and noon. So that's where we are. So next week, let's pick up with Luke 23, 44. As we come to noon, the halfway point of the Lord's crucifixion, and we'll pick up there. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Be sure to send me any prayer concerns so I can get those in the bulletin. Please be sure to sign up online for worship this coming Lord's Day. This would be a great time to do it right now while the computer's there beside you or your phone or whatever. And again, we'll have the one service at 9 a.m. And then if needed, we will replay that service on the projector at 1030. But we're hoping everybody can make it at 9. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. And thank you for allowing your only son to come to this earth in the flesh and to suffer and die for us so that our sins could be forgiven. Thank you, Father, for the cross. Tonight we pray for our members and our friends and loved ones who are recovering from the virus, and we pray that they would continue to grow stronger every day. We also pray for the seniors of the congregation, as some of them have been away from their friends and Christian family for almost a year now. We pray for strength and patience for those who serve as caregivers, and in all things we ask that you would be merciful. We come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.